Good evening. Welcome all of you to the sixth and final uh, Wednesday service here in the season of Lent. So we're glad to have you join us uh, for this. Uh, as always, uh, everything in this service uh, can be found in the bulletin uh, that you grabbed on the way in. And so, again, everything is in there. Everything is printed there. Uh, and so we'll be following along with that. Uh, tonight we also have the wonderful gift of having uh, the uh, kiddos. Uh, they'll be uh, playing the uh, chimes tonight. Uh, and so we we're uh, happy to have them play uh, once again for us. So we begin our worship service tonight with our opening hymn. You can see it printed uh, in your bulletin. Uh, we stay seated as we sing our opening hymn, Today Your Mercy Calls Us. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift up my hands toward your most holy place. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. O oh, most merciful God, since you have given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy on us sinners, and for his sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Brothers and sisters, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting our sins against us. Therefore I tell you that all your sins 
are forgiven for his sake. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated as we hear our special music. So a huge thank you to Mary Jo for uh, uh, being able to work with the kids this year and a uh, uh, big thank you to the parents for uh, allowing your kids to come and play as part of the prime times in this uh, spring season. So wonderful job, everyone. Our worship this evening continues with our scripture readings. The first is from Ezekiel chapter 18, as printed in our bulletins. The prophet writes, But if a wicked person turns away from all the sins they have committed, and keeps all my decrees, and does what is just and right, that person will surely live. They will not die. None of the offenses they have committed will be remembered against them. Because of the righteous things they have done, they will live. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? But if a, per a righteous person turns from their righteousness and commits sin and does the same detestable things the wicked person does, will they live? None of the righteous things that person has done will be remembered. Because of the unfaithfulness they are guilty, they are guilty of, and because of the sins they have committed, they will die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear you, Israelites, is my way unjust? Is it not your ways that are unjust? If a righteous person turns from their righteousness and commits sin, they will die for it. Because of the sin they have committed, they will die. But if a wicked person turns away from the wickedness they have committed and does what is just and right, they will save their life. Because they consider all the offenses they have committed and turn away from them, that person will surely live. They will not die. Yet the Israelites say the way of the Lord is not just. Are my ways unjust, people of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent, turn away from all your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The next scripture reading is from Ephesians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul writes, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. 
They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. And they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue as we sing together our sermon hymn as printed in our bulletin. Who's using this before? It was a short person. That's all right. Got the stool fixed. So let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you for this evening. Uh, Lord, as we uh, come close uh, to wrapping up the season of Lent, we thank you for this special season. We thank you that throughout this season, you have allowed us uh, to spend this time focusing on the different temptations that we face, the ways that we sin, but even more so the ways that you come to us uh, to call us to confess, to call us to repent, and to declare to us that we are indeed forgiven for Jesus' sake. And so, Lord, as we wrap things up tonight, as we look at what it means uh, to be forgiven people, transform people who seek to bring about restoration, to bring about reconciliation, I pray that the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts will be pleasing in your sight, O Lord our God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Again, tonight we're uh, wrapping up our Wednesday sermon series that we started all the way back uh, on Ash Wednesday. Uh, It's called The Penitent Life. And so throughout this series, we've looked at different aspects of what we experience on a regular basis, from temptation to to sin to conviction, uh, repentance, forgiveness, and so forth. And as we look back at all these different areas, as we reflect upon uh, these different topics that the scriptures talk about. You know, these are all areas that we deal with on a constant basis, that, that we in, uh, encounter on a, a daily basis in some way, shape, or form in our life. You know, every day we are tempted. You know, we're tempted by either uh, the devil, the world, or our own sinful flesh. That, that when we are tempted daily, we're, we're tempted to fall into despair or hopelessness or faithlessness or we are tempted to fall into sin. Every day, we sin. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, but again, we are by nature sinful people. From the moment we were given life, we were spiritually dead, blind, and enemies of God. But on top of that, every day we do things, we say things, we think things, we desire things that are contrary to God's will, that are sins against God and sins against the people around us. But again, as we focused on a few weeks ago, the Spirit comes to us after we have sinned, after we have given in to temptation, we have fallen into sin. The Spirit comes to us to convict us, that is to show us that we have sinned, to show us that we have fallen short, and to lead us into confession, whether we confess to God what we have done, or to confess to the people in our lives the ways that we have sinned against them, the ways that we have harmed them, and brought pain and suffering into their lives. And having confessed our sins, the Holy Spirit also leads us into repentance. Because we talked about that's taking the U-turn. It's saying, I'm walking away from God, walking into sin. Repentance is returning to the Lord and walking in fellowship with Him. And the incredible news is, as we talked about last week, when we confess our sins, when we as repentant people acknowledge our sins, God says every single time, I will forgive you. That when we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and he'll forgive our sins, and he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And to be forgiven simply means that God tells us we do not need to pay the price for our sins. That he paid the price in our place on the cross. Again, that great exchange where God takes our sin, takes our brokenness, and in its place gives us forgiveness and life and peace and salvation. Again, as we reflect on all these things that we focus on over the last five weeks, we wrap things up by looking at how we respond to all this. And we're called to respond with pursuing restoration, pursuing reconciliation, That in the fruit of forgiveness, we are called to make right what we broke in our sin. To pursue reconciliation with the the, uh, relationships that we damaged. There's a story about uh, a husband and a wife. And they got into an argument. And they decided to give each other the silent treatment. And so that nighttime, the husband went to bed. He was still furious with his wife. But he all of a sudden remembered that he was dependent upon her to wake up in the morning. Because he was a very heavy sleeper, and he knew in the morning he had a very important meeting at work at 9 o'clock. And so he needed to get up 
at 7 in the morning. But again, he was unwilling to reconcile with his wife. So he decided to write her a note. And he simply said, please wake me up at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. And he put it on her side of the bed. Well, the next morning came and he woke up and he looked at the clock and it was 9.30 in the morning. And he was furious. And he stomped off to the bathroom to get ready. And he was angry with his wife. And as he's starting to get ready, he looks at a note that looks almost identical to the one that he had written for his wife. And it was laying on the counter of the bathroom. And it simply said, honey, it's 7.30 in the morning. You don't want to be late. Again, tonight we're going to be looking at this topic of reconciliation, restoration after we've gone through this process of confessing our sins, of receiving forgiveness. And the great example, probably one of the best examples of these different elements that we focus on, again, from temptation all the way to forgiveness to restoration, can be seen in the account of Jesus with Zacchaeus. Now read for us the first part of this account. This is from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 2. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. So the two details that we are told from the very beginning is that this Zacchaeus was one of the big-time tax collectors there in a very large, very well um, very well-known, very uh, 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 affluent, prosperous, busy town of Jericho. And being a chief tax collector, he was also very rich because the way that the tax collectors would work back in Jesus' time was that they would charge taxes on behalf of the Roman Empire, but they could charge whatever they wanted and keep the extras. In fact, one of the Bible commentaries explains it this way. It says, the Roman system of taxation was frequently characterized by, quote, tax farming, where an individual would bid to collect taxes for the Roman government throughout an entire district and then add a surcharge or commission, often exorbitant, which they kept for themselves as their profit. The tax collectors referred to it in the New Testament were generally not the holders of these tax contracts themselves, but hired subordinates who were often local residents. Since these tax collectors worked for Rome, even indirectly, excuse me, even indirectly, they were viewed as traitors to their own people and were not well liked. In addition, the system offered many opportunities for dishonesty and greed, both of which were often associated with local tax collector. So again, we have Zacchaeus, who was not simply a normal tax collector, he was a chief tax collector. And the fact that he was rich meant that he had taken well advantage, plenty of advantage, of the opportunities afforded to him. And so for Zacchaeus, in his position of power, he was tempted. He was tempted to steal from other people, to abuse that position of power, to gain his finances unjustly by taking, again, advantage of the people that he's taxing. But as we see, not only was he tempted to do this, but he actually did it. He gave in to that temptation. He gave in to that temptation to swindle people, to rip people off, to become powerful and rich on their, excuse me, at their expense. But for some reason, Zacchaeus had this desire to spend time with Jesus. And so Luke continues on in verses 3 through 7. He says, he that is Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. You know, we, we aren't told specifics of what happened at this dinner party. But it became, uh, becomes, excuse me, becomes evident very quickly that Zacchaeus sees his sin. He's convicted of the ways 
that he has defrauded other people, that he's taken advantage of other people, that he has gained on the pain and the suffering of other people. That he's convicted of what he's done and he desires a new life. He desires to repent, that is to turn away from this life of stealing, of thievery in this tax collecting and live a life of faithfulness to God. A life of serving and loving others. In fact, we see this as he continues on in verses, uh, excuse me, uh, 8 through 10. It says, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Because the Son of Man too, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. So, again, we're told, we don't have a lot of the specifics, but when he encounters Jesus, he realizes he needs to change. And he makes this change. But I want you to imagine the scenario where Zacchaeus would encounter Jesus realizes that he defrauds people, confesses that sin, and repents of that sin, and then kind of wants to move on. So so imagine that Zacchaeus was your local tax collector. He has this encounter with Jesus, and he realizes he's been living, excuse me, uh, excuse me, he's been living this wicked life, this sinful life, and he wants to change his way. So he comes up to you and says, hey, I know I overtaxed you, I overcharged you. I know I essentially stole money from you, but you know what? I'm sorry for what I did. Will you forgive me? You'd probably say, that's great. I'm glad you've had a change of heart. I'm glad you're going to change your ways, but you consider giving me my money back? (laughs) You know, all the stuff you took from me, you want to give it back to me? You see, that's what he did. As a fruit of his new life, evidence of his forgiveness. He says, I don't want to simply say, please forgive me for what I did. He says, I want to make things right. I want to restore the brokenness that I caused. I want to bring about reconciliation in the relationships that I damaged. I want to make things right because I'm the one who messed them up with my sin. And so again, when he says, this is what I'm going to do, in fact, he says, in doing this, he's going over and above what was expected of him according to the law of Moses written back in Exodus. In fact, Exodus 22, verse 3, says this about restoration. It says, anyone who steals must certainly make restitution. And again, we see Zacchaeus doing that, but doing that in abundance in this new life because of what Christ has done for him. As we look at this last area, this area of repentance, excuse me, of reconciliation, of restoration, it's absolutely vital for us to remember that in Christ Jesus, we are forgiven people. That the Bible is absolutely clear that when we confess our sins, when we are repentant people, God comes to us and declares us forgiven. He says, as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your sins from you. But the fruit of that forgiveness should take the shape of pursuing restoration, pursuing reconciliation. Because again, every time that we fall into temptation, every time that we sin, especially against other people, That sin causes brokenness. That that sin brings about something bad in the lives of those that we sin against. And so when we are told that we are forgiven, in that forgiveness, in that new life, we ought to have this desire to say, I want to fix the mess that I made as much as I can. I want to make things right because I'm the one that created this problem. I want to show you through my deeds, through my words, through my actions. I want to show you the forgiveness that I have in Christ Jesus. And I want to make things whole again because I'm the one that brought this brokenness. This is why we're called to pursue reconciliation, that when we sin and cause fractures in relationships, 
We are called in our forgiveness to pursue that reconciliation, to restore the relationships that we broke through our own sinfulness. And so as we close things up, again, not just this message, but this whole series, my prayer for us is that we would be like Zacchaeus, that we would be people that understand that we are, by nature and by choice, sinful and broken people. That far more than we are aware of, that we have sinned against God and we have sinned against others. We have created great harm and damage and pain and suffering in other people's lives, whether we know it or not. But because of Christ Jesus, we are forgiven people. We are redeemed people. We are new people with new lives. And in light of that, again, like Zacchaeus, Our desire is to be restoration, to fix that brokenness. And in so doing, people will see the forgiveness that God has so freely granted to us. So may God bless us. May he give us the strength and the wisdom that we need to restore relationships that need mending to fix brokenness that needs to be uh, fixed. That he would be with us as we live as forgiven people, as redeemed people, as saved people, as God's people. As we live as people who live each day to restore and mend the brokenness that came about because of sin. May God walk with us and bless us as we do this. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we are indeed forgiven people. Lord, allow us to imitate your servant Zacchaeus, to acknowledge freely our sin, to confess our brokenness to you and to the people that we have sinned against. And Lord, allow us to rejoice in the forgiveness that you so freely shower upon us. As your forgiven people, Lord, allow us to pursue uh, uh, restoration and reconciliation with the people around us, the people that we have harmed. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, mend the brokenness, that things may be whole again in whatever areas that need to be made whole. We pray all this and so much more in your name, Jesus. Amen. At this time, I invite you to stand as we respond to God's word. Throughout this season of Lent on Wednesdays, we've been going through Luther's small catechism, focusing on the area of confession and absolution, as well as the office of the keys. And so with our catechism review this evening, we conclude with these words from the small catechism. And so I ask all of us, St. John the Evangelist writes in chapter 20, the Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. What do you believe according to these words? I believe that when the called ministers of Christ deal with us by his divine command, in particular when they exclude openly unrepentant sinners from the Christian congregation and absolve those who repent of their sins and want to do better, this is just as valid and certain, even in heaven, as of Christ our dear Lord, dealt with us himself. We continue this time with our offerings. As a reminder, uh, if you brought a physical offering and didn't have a chance to put in the offering plan on the way in, you can do so on the way out. Uh, you can also always give online as well on our website, stjohnwoodbury.org. So again, we thank you for your uh, uh, faithfulness to the mission and ministry here at St. John. We continue at this time with our prayers as printed in the bulletin. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O God, you are compassionate and gracious. O Christ, you are compassionate and gracious. O God, you are compassionate and gracious. From doubts and fears that would distract us from faith, O Lord, protect us by your hand. From every evil influence that would lead us into sin, O Lord, protect us by your hand. From the wickedness in our own hearts, O Lord, protect us by your hand. From calamities of fire and adverse weather, O Lord, protect us by your hand. From evil plots of terrorists and criminals, O Lord, protect us by your hand. 
We pray for those who face trials of illness or bereavement. Support them in their hour of need with your protecting hand, granting them hope and healing. We pray for the children of our congregation. Protect them in your loving hands, helping them to grow in faith and wisdom. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your, t- in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. We stay standing as we sing our closing hymn. be seated. Again, we thank you for worshiping with us this evening, and uh, we thank you for worshiping with us throughout this season of Lent on these Wednesdays, and uh, we're uh, glad to have you here, especially during these times. Uh, Just a few uh, quick reminders. Uh, So tomorrow night, as a reminder, uh, is Pastor Stadler's online Bible study, uh, Walking with Jesus, uh, through Holy Week. So again, that's on Zoom only. You can find that uh, link on our website. Um, and if you aren't able to make it tomorrow night, uh, we'll put the recording of that study up uh, later this weekend. So again, that's tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Uh, also, this Sunday is Palm Sunday. Uh, and with that, we will reintroduce uh, some of our normal communion. So again, as we've talked about the last couple of weeks, it won't be at the altar, but we will have continuous communion. Uh, do it much like we did with Ash Wednesday. Uh, so again, that will be available this Sunday and uh, Sundays going forward. Uh, for those that would like to still take uh, the... Uh, packets of communion and do it from your chairs. Uh, That will be available as well uh, if you would like. And then next week we do enter into Holy Week. So next week, uh, Monday, Thursday, we have worship at 7 o'clock. So no Wednesday stuff next week. So that's uh, tonight is it for that. Next uh, week again, Monday, Thursday at 7 o'clock with the stripping of the altar. Good Friday we'll have two services, 5.30 and 7 o'clock. And then Easter Sunday we'll have three services. So 8 o'clock, 9.15 and at uh, 10.30. So we will have overflow seating, so we'll make sure we have enough seating so uh, we can have people in here, but also uh, keep the distancing and, and stay safe with that. Uh, so that's the plan for next week. So again, we thank you for worshiping with us tonight. We pray you have a wonderful rest of your evening and a blessed rest of your week. Uh, we close with the Lord's dismissal. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.